Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book One, Chapter Eighteen. In Search of Water. Lake Salinas ends the string of lagoons connected with the Sierras Ventana and Guamini. Numerous expeditions were formerly made there from Buenos Aires to collect the salt deposited on its banks, as the waters contain great quantities of chloride of sodium. But when Thalke spoke of the lake as supplying drinkable water, he was thinking of the rios of fresh water which run into it. Those streams, however, were all dried up also, and the burning sun had drunk up everything liquid and the consternation of the travellers may be imagined at the discovery. Some action must be taken immediately, however, for what little water still remained was almost bad, and could not quench thirst. Hunger and fatigue were forgotten in the face of this imperious necessity. The sort of leather tent called a ruka, which had been left by the natives, afforded the party a temporary resting-place, and the weary horses stretched themselves along the muddy banks, and tried to browse on the marine plants and dry reeds they found there nauseous to the taste as they must have been. As soon as the whole party were ensconced in the ruka, Paginal asked Thalcave what he thought was best to be done. A rapid conversation followed, a few words of which were intelligible to Glenavon. Thalcave spoke calmly, but the lively Frenchman gesticulated enough for both. After a little, Thalcave sat silent and folded his arms. "'What does he say?' asked Glenavon. "'I fancied he was advising us to separate.' "'Yes, into two parties. "'Those of us whose horses are so done out with fatigue and thirst "'that they can scarcely drag one leg after the other "'are to continue the route as best they can, "'while the others, whose steeds are fresher, "'are to push on in advance toward the river Guamini, "'which throws itself into Lake San Lucas about thirty-one miles off. "'If there should be water enough in the river, "'they are to wait on the banks till their companions reach them, "'but should it be dried up, "'they will hasten back and spare them a useless journey.' "'And what will we do then?' asked Austin. "'Then we shall have to make up our minds to go seventy-two miles south, "'as far as the commencement of the Sierra Ventana, where the rivers abound. "'It is wise counsel, and we will act upon it without loss of time. "'My horse is intolerable, good trim, and I volunteer to accompany Thalcave.' "'Oh, my lord, take me,' said Robert, as if it were a question of some pleasure party. "'But would you be able for it, my boy? "'Oh, I have a fine beast.' "'which just wants to have a gallop. "'Please, my lord, to take me.' "'Come, then, my boy,' said Glenavon, "'delighted not to leave Robert behind. "'If we three don't manage to find out fresh water somewhere,' "'he added, "'we must be very stupid.' "'Well, well, what about me?' said Paginal. "'Oh, my dear Paginal, you must stay with the reserve corps,' "'replied the Major. "'You are too well acquainted with the 37th parallel "'and the river Guamini and the whole pampas for us to let you go.' Neither Mulready, nor Wilson, nor myself would be able to rejoin Thalke with the given rendezvous, but we would put ourselves under the banner of the brave Jacques Paginal with perfect confidence. "'I resign myself,' said the geographer, much flattered at having supreme command. "'But, Paginal, no distractions,' added the Major. "'Don't you take us to the wrong place, to the borders of the Pacific, for instance?' "'Oh, you insufferable Major, it would serve you right,' replied Paginal, laughing." "'But how will you manage to understand what Thalcave says, Glenavon?' he continued. "'I suppose,' replied Glenavon, "'the Patagonian and I won't have much to talk about. "'Besides, I know a few Spanish words, and, at a pinch, "'I should not fear either making him understand me or my understanding him. "'Go, then, my worthy friend.' "'We'll have supper first, rejoined Glenavon, "'and then sleep, if we can, till it is starting time.' "'The supper was not very reviving without drink of any kind.' and they tried to make up for the lack of it by a good sleep. But Paginal dreamed of water all night, of torrents and cascades, of rivers and ponds, and streams and brooks. In fact, he had a complete nightmare. Next morning, at six o'clock, the horses of Thalcave, Glenavon, and Robert were got ready. The last ration of water was given to them, and drunk with more avidity than satisfaction, for it is filthy, disgusting stuff. The three travellers then jumped onto their saddles and set off, shouting au revoir to their companions. "'Don't come back, whatever you do,' called Paginal after them. The Desertio de las Salinas, which they had come to traverse, is a high plain, covered with stunted trees not above ten feet high, and small mimosas, which the Indians call curamamel, and jumez, a bushy shrub rich in soda. Here and there large spaces were covered with salt, 
which sparkled in the sunlight with astonishing brilliancy. These might easily have been taken for sheets of ice, had not the intense heat forbidden the illusion, and the contrast between these dazzling white sheets presented the dry, burned-up ground gave the desert a most peculiar character. Eighty miles south from the contrary, the Sierra Ventana, toward which the travellers might possibly have to betake themselves should the Guamini disappoint their hopes, the landscape was totally different. There the fertility is splendid, the pasturage is incomparable. Unfortunately, to reach them would necessitate a march of one hundred and thirty miles south, and this was why Thalcave thought it best to go first to Guamini, as it was not only much nearer, but also on the direct line of route. The three horses went forward, might and main, as if instinctively knowing whither they were bound. Thayuka especially displayed a courage that neither fatigue nor hunger could damp. He bounded like a bird over the dried-up canadas and the bushes of the Kuramamal, his loud, joyous neighing seeming to bode success to the search. The horses of Glenavon and Robert, though not so light-footed, felt the spur of his example and followed him bravely. Thalcave inspirited his companions as much as Thayuka did his four-footed brethren. He sat motionless in the saddle, but often turned his head to look at Robert, and ever and anon gave him a shout of encouragement and approval, as he saw how well he rode. Certainly the boy deserved praise, for he was fast becoming an excellent cavalier. "'Bravo, Robert,' said Glenavon. "'Thalcave is evidently congratulating you, my boy, and paying you compliments.' "'What for, my lord?' "'For your good horsemanship.' "'I can hold firm on, that's all,' replied Robert, blushing with pleasure at such an encomium. "'That is the principal thing, Robert, and you are too modest. I tell you that some day you will turn out to be an accomplished horseman.' "'What would Papa say to that?' said Robert, laughing. "'He wants me to be a sailor.' "'The one won't hinder the other. If all cavaliers wouldn't make good sailors, there is no reason why all sailors should not make good horsemen. To keep one's footing on the yards must teach a man to hold on firm.' and, as to managing the reins, and making a horse go through all sorts of movements, that's easily acquired. Indeed, it comes naturally. Poor father, said Robert, how he will thank you for saving his life. You love him very much, Robert? Yes, my lord, dearly. He was so good to me and my sister. We were his only thought. And whenever he came home from his voyages, we were sure of some souvenir from all the places he had been to, and, better still, of loving words and caresses. Ah, if you knew him, you would love him, too. Mary is most like him. He has a soft voice, like hers. That's strange for sailor, isn't it? Yes, Robert, very strange. I see him still, the boy went on, as if speaking to himself. Good brave papa. He put me to sleep on his knee, crooning an old Scotch ballad about the locks of our country. The time sometimes comes back to me, but very confused-like. "'So it does to Mary, too. "'Ah, my lord, how we loved him. "'Well, I do think one needs to be little to love one's father like that.' "'Yes, and to be grown up, my child, to venerate him,' replied Glenavon, "'deeply touched by the boy's genuine affection. "'During this conversation the horses had been slackening speed, "'and were only walking now. "'You will find him?' said Robert again, after a few minutes' silence. "'Yes, we will find him.' was Glenavon's reply. Thalcave has set us on the track, and I have some great confidence in him. Thalcave is a brave Indian, isn't he? said the boy. That indeed he is. Do you know something, my lord? What is it, and then I will tell you? That all the people you have with you are brave. Lady Helena, who I love so, and the Major with his calm manner, and Captain Mangles, and Monsieur Paganel, and all the sailors on the Duncan. How courageous and devoted they are! "'Yes, my boy, I know that,' replied Glenavon. "'And you know that you are the best of all?' "'No, most certainly I don't know that.' "'Well, it is time you did, my lord,' said the boy, seizing his lordship's hand and covering it with kisses. Glenavon shook his head, but said no more, as a gesture from Thalcave made them spur on their horses and hurry forward. But it was soon evident that, with the exception of Thayuka, the wearied animals could not go quicker than a walking pace. At noon they were obliged to let them rest for an hour. They could not go on at all, and refused to eat the alpha feras, a poor burnt-up sort of lucerne that grew there. Glenavon began to be uneasy. Tokens of sterility were not the least on the decrease, and the want of water might involve serious calamities. 
Falco said nothing, thinking probably that it would be time enough to despair if the Guamini should be dried up, if, indeed, the heart of an Indian can ever despair. Spur and whip had both to be employed to induce the poor animals to resume the route, and then they only crept along, for their strength was gone. Theuka, indeed, could have galloped swiftly enough, and reached the Rio in a few hours, but Thalke would not leave his companions behind, alone in the midst of a desert. It was hard work, however, to get the animal to consent to walk quietly. He kicked and reared and neighed violently, and was subdued at last by his master's voice more than hand. Thalke positively talked to the beast, and Theuka understood perfectly, though unable to reply, for, after a great deal of arguing, the noble creature yielded, though he still champed a bit. Thalcave did not understand Theuka, it turned out, though Theuka understood him. The intelligent animal felt humidity in the atmosphere, and drank it in with frenzy, moving and making a noise with his tongue, as if taking deep draughts of some cool, refreshing liquid. The Patagonian could not mistake him now. Water was not far off. The two other horses seemed to catch their comrade's meaning, and, inspired by his example, made a last effort and galloped forward after the Indian. About three o'clock a white line appeared in the dip of the road, and seemed to tremble in the sunlight. "'Water!' exclaimed Glenavon. "'Yes, yes, it's water!' shouted Glenavon. They were right, and the horses knew it too, for there was no need now to urge them on. They tore over the ground as if mad, and in a few minutes had reached the river, and plunged in up to their chests. Their masters had to go on too, whether they would or not, but they were so rejoiced at being able to quench their thirst that this compulsory bath was no grievance. "'Oh, how delicious this is!' exclaimed Robert, taking a deep draught. "'Drink moderately, my boy,' said Glenavon, but he did not set the example. Thalcave drank very quietly, without hurrying himself, taking small gulps, but as long as a lazo, as the Patagonians say. He seemed as if he were never going to leave off, and really there was some danger of his swallowing up the whole river. At last Glenavon said, "'Well, our friends won't be disappointed this time. They will be sure of finding clear, cool water when they get here, that is to say, if Thalcave leaves any for them. But couldn't we go to meet them? It would spare them several hours suffering and anxiety.' "'You're right, my boy, but how could we carry them this water? The leather bottles were left with Wilson.' "'No, it is better for us to wait for them, as we agreed. "'They can't be here till the middle of the night, "'so the best thing we can do is to get a good bed and a good supper ready for them.' "'Thalcave had not waited for Glenavon's proposition to prepare the encampment. "'He had been fortunate enough to discover on the banks of the Rio Aramada "'a sort of enclosure, which had served as a fold for flocks, "'and was shut in on three sides.' A more suitable place could not be found for the night's lodging, provided they had no fear of sleeping in the open air beneath the starlit heavens, and none of Thalcave's companions had much solicitude on that score. Accordingly they took possession at once, and stretched themselves at full length on the ground in the bright sunshine to dry their dripping garments. "'Well, now, we've secured a lodging, and we must think of supper,' said Glenavon. "'Our friends must not have reason to complain of the couriers they sent to precede them, "'and if I am not much mistaken, they will be very satisfied. "'It strikes me that an hour's shooting won't be lost time. "'Are you ready, Robert?' "'Yes, my lord,' replied the boy, standing up, gun in hand. "'Why Glenavon proposed this was, "'that the banks of the Guamini seemed to be the general rendezvous of the game and surrounding plains. "'A sort of partridge peculiar to the Pampas, called the Tinamu, black wood hens, a species of plover called Turu Turu, yellow rays and waterfowl with magnificent green plumage, rose in coveys. No quadrupeds, however, were visible, but Thalcave pointed to the long grass and thick brushwood and gave his friends to understood that they were lying there in concealment. Disdaining the feathered tribes when more substantial game was at hand, the hunters' first shots were fired into the underwood. Instantly there rose by the hundred roebucks and guanacos, like those that had swept over them that terrible night in the Cordilleras. But the timid creatures were so frightened that they were all out of gunshot in a twinkling. The hunters were obliged to content themselves with a humbler game, though in an alimentary point of view nothing better could be wished. A dozen of red partridges and rays were speedily brought down, and Glenavon also very cleverly managed to kill a te tetra or peccary, a pachydermatous animal, the flesh of which is excellent eating. In less than half an hour, the hunters had all the game they required. Robert had killed a curious animal belonging to the order Indentita, 
an armadillo, a sort of tattoo, covered with a hard bony shell in movable pieces, and measuring a foot and a half long. It was very fat and would make an excellent dish, the Patagonian said. Robert was very proud of his success. Thalcave did his part by patching in Nandu, a species of ostrich, remarkable for its extreme swiftness. There could be no entrapping such an animal, and the Indian did not attempt it. He urged the Uka to a gallop and made a direct attack, knowing that if the first aim missed, the Nandu would soon tire out horse and rider by involving them in an inextricable labyrinth of windings. The moment, therefore, that Thalcave got to the right distance, he flung his burlas with such a powerful hand, and so skilfully, that he caught the bird round the legs and paralysed his efforts at once. In a few seconds it lay flat on the ground. The Indian had not made his capture for the mere pleasure and glory of such a novel chase. The flesh of a Nandu is highly esteemed, and Thalke felt bound to contribute his share to the common repast. They returned to the Ramada, bringing back the string of partridges, the ostrich, the peccary, and the armadillo. The ostrich and the peccary were prepared for cooking by divesting them of their tough skins and cutting them into thin slices. As the armadillo, he carries his cooking apparatus with him, and all that had to be done was to place him in his own shell over the glowing embers. The substantial dishes were reserved for the nightcomers, and the three hunters contented themselves with devouring the partridges, and washed down their meal with clear, fresh water, which was pronounced superior to all the porter in the world, even to the famous highland Uskabor, or whisky. The horses had not been overlooked. A large quantity of dry fodder was discovered lying heaped up in the Ramada, and this was supplied to them amply with both food and bedding. When all was ready, the three companions wrapped themselves in the ponchos, and stretched themselves on an eiderdown of alfalfares, the usual bed of hunters in the pampas. End of Book One Chapter 18